The all-time best-selling and most popular Android phone, Samsung Galaxy S, has arrived in its 11th iteration. That doesn't mean, though, that it's labeled as such, since Samsung decided to switch it up and instead of Galaxy S11 gave us the Galaxy S20. At this very moment, the S20 series is being presented on the launch event in San Francisco. This year we're not attending the premiere, but instead we had a more exclusive chance to see, touch, try out and film the new Galaxy phones a week ahead of launch in Munich, a privilege which was given to only a small number of select journalists from around the world. Therefore, we are able to tell you all about S20 probably 10 hours earlier than if we were attending the premiere. To be fair, the presentation in Munich was brief, so there may be some small details about the phones that we didn't get to hear. Also, Galaxy Fold Z will be presented in San Francisco as well, but we'll have a chance to see that phone in Barcelona on the World Mobile Congress. This year, Galaxy S series consists of three models. A standard S20 and S20 Plus were expected, but instead of the smallest S10e we saw last year, now we have the biggest and best model in the series, the Galaxy S20 Ultra. This move indicates that we'll probably not be seeing small screen phones anymore, since there is obviously not enough interest in them. Those of you who prefer compact phones will not like this, but that's the way it is. The smallest S20 you can get now is the vanilla version with a 6.2 inch screen and when you compare it to S20 Plus and S20 Ultra which come in 6.7 and 6.9 inch screens respectively, it does look significantly smaller. Even though 0.7 inches doesn't seem like much, it's definitely noticeable in the overall size. Speaking of screen, which is one aspect in which Samsung was always a step or two ahead of the competition, there's one important detail. Quad HD Plus Dynamic AMOLED now comes with a 120Hz refresh rate. Just a few months ago we were admiring the 90Hz screen on a OnePlus 7 phone, which was also manufactured by Samsung, and wondered why it wasn't implemented on any of Samsung's own phones. The answer is that they had something more advanced in store that they saved for the prestigious Galaxy S series. 120Hz makes everything look more fluid and alive, but you also have an option to use the good old 60Hz, which consumes less battery power. We will know the exact figures once we receive the phones for the review, but all in all we do think high refresh rate is a very nice feature. That's not all though, since Touch Digitizer refreshes at 240Hz, which should bring snappier and more precise control. The default screen resolution is 2400 by 1080 pixels, while the actual panel resolution is 3200 by 1440. If you choose the high resolution, you do get a better display, but at the cost of a higher power consumption and inability to use 120Hz, so we think most users will just stick to default. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but UHD resolution seems to be long gone from the mobile phones, probably because manufacturers figured it is an overkill. S20 series displays offer pixel densities of 563, 525 and 511 pixels per inch, with the smaller model having the highest one due to smaller screen and the same resolution as other models. We'll end the display talk with one thing that is on it, but not a part of it. We are of course talking about the punch hole camera, which was moved to the middle of the top of the screen like on Galaxy Note 10, and none of the models come with a dual front camera like one we saw on S10+. Plus. Now let's talk about the design, which may be more or less important to users, but surely is an important aspect of a flagship phone. If you look at the shape, slim bezels and build quality, it's all absolutely top notch. Until you notice the camera model. Not that we particularly like the way it was designed on S10 series, but this time around we like it even less. Sure, it's a matter of taste and I get the trends, but I much prefer the symmetry of Huawei Mate 20 Pro or Motorola One Zoom. This way, with the camera model shifted to the side, it looks like a foreign object that someone slapped over an otherwise nice design. Then again, people like iPhone 11, so to each their own, I guess. Good thing though is that the volume keys are now back on their proper position, on the right side above the power key. Last year's experiment with them being on the left side obviously didn't go well with the users. As expected from a flagship phone, S20 series is well protected by a Gorilla Glass 6 on both the screen and the back, plus it is IP68 certified water and dustproof. If the weight of the device is an important factor to you, keep in mind that the Ultra version is 221 grams, while smaller models are 30 and 50 grams lighter. When it comes to hardware, the global non-US version traditionally comes with Samsung's own Exynos chipset. This time it's the Exynos 990, while US models will have a more desirable Snapdragon 865. 
Years ago, this wasn't a big deal as Snapdragon chipsets weren't as dominant, but last two generations, the Snapdragon 845 and 855 were faster and more energy efficient than an equivalent Exynos chipset by a lot. This was especially noticeable with battery life, which was quite underwhelming with Exynos models. We'll have to wait and see if the new Exynos is better and hope that Samsung did a better job with their own chipset this time around. Some early benchmarks indicate that 7 nanometer Exynos 990 is slightly faster in single core but slower in multi core tests. Chipset is not the only hardware innovation since S20 comes with a new ultra fast LPDDR5 memory, which is also Samsung made and should be about 30% faster than LPDDR4 used in S10 series. This goes for 12GB, while some info indicates that 16GB modules which are in S20 Ultra might be an additional 20% faster since they are made in newer production process. We'll see about that when they become available for testing. Anyway, the S20 will come in 8GB and 12GB versions and with 128GB of storage. S20 Plus will have 8 plus 128 and 12 plus 512 gigabyte versions, while the Ultra will come with 12 or 16 gigabytes of RAM and 128 or 512 gigabytes of storage. All the models support micro SD cards with capacities of up to 1 terabyte, and you might just need one even though they're about $300 since 8K videos can be quite large in size. Yeah, 8K, but more on that when we get to the cameras. Battery capacities in Galaxy S20, S20 Plus and S20 Ultra are 4000, 4500 and 5000 mAh respectively. 45W quick charging is supported, but you'll only find 25W charger in the package, so to make the most out of it, you'll have to buy a 45W one. At the prices these phones cost, which we'll discuss later, we think that they could have included a better charger as well. And now we're getting to the good stuff. There were two things that Samsung highlighted when it comes to S20, 5G connectivity and camera capabilities. Currently only 2% of phones in use worldwide supports 5G, but it is expected that this figure will go up to 18% by the end of the 2020. Given the tempo at which 5G infrastructure is expanding, 5G might be of use to you if you intend to keep your phone for 2 or 3 years. Either way, 5G is supported by all S20 models, though Samsung might offer 4G versions as well, at least on some markets. So what about the cameras? It seems that the cameras have become the one thing that defines whether the phone is good or not and an aspect that pretty much defines its success. We've known for months now that Samsung had a 108 megapixel sensor ready for its S20 series. They did sell a 108 megapixel sensor to Xiaomi for its Mi Note 10, but that wasn't the same one, plus that phone wasn't quite powerful enough to handle 108 megapixel photos properly. So what exactly did Samsung do with Galaxy S20s? For starters, they made a distinct difference between different models. Unlike S20 and Ultra, the regular S20 has no TOF camera, while the infamous 108 megapixel sensor is present only in the Ultra version. Galaxy S20 has three cameras. Main one is a wide angle 12 megapixel f1.8 sensor with a dual pixel face detection autofocus and optical image stabilization. Ultra wide camera is also 12 megapixel but f2.2 and with no optical stabilization, though it supports super steady video and autofocus. Third camera is a 64 megapixel f2.0 telephoto sensor with optical stabilization and 3 time hybrid optical zoom that combines with digital for up to 30 time magnification. Samsung calls this super resolution zoom. Galaxy S20 Plus has an identical camera system to this except that it has an added time of flight depth sensor. The S20 Ultra is certainly the most interesting. Its primary sensor is the long-awaited 108 megapixel f1.8 wide sensor with optical stabilization that uses non-binning technology to group 9 pixels into one, thus allowing the camera a better low light performance. Ultra wide and TOF sensors are the same that we got on S20 Plus, but the fourth one is the 48 megapixel f3.5 telephoto with a super resolution zoom of up to 100 times. We'll discuss its usability later, but we have to mention that during the presentation we got no info on actual optical zoom used in this case. Some sources say it's 10 times, but we'll have to wait and see if that is actually the case. During the presentation we had about an hour to spend with all three models, which was enough to get video footage and get an impression of what these phone's cameras are capable of. We'll start with video recording, which offers quite fascinating options of recording 8K resolution videos in 30fps or 4K videos with up to 120fps. Now these are some serious figures. 
In comparison, a month ago we switched our main camera rig to 6K which costs an arm and a leg and now there's a mobile phone camera that does 8K. This feature is currently only supported on Exynos 990 and Snapdragon 865 chipsets. As for the quality of such 8K video, we can't judge until we do a proper test since the small screen is no indicator. You can do an in-phone 4K or Full HD conversion so we can view the video on a TV or share it to social media. Many users will probably like the 8K video snap option which will allow them to get 33 megapixel photos out of a video. Samsung phones are known as the best video recorders in Android domain and this is only improved by super steady option which stabilizes walking footage and makes it smoother, something like what we saw on last gen action cameras. Night videos are also improved, plus there is a night hyperlapse option which might be interesting to try out. As for the photos, we will give our judgment once we get to test the phones thoroughly. We did shoot some, but we had no monitor to examine them properly. What we liked a lot was the single take feature which lets you shoot a scene, but also move while you're doing it and the process takes approximately 6 to 7 seconds. The end result is a series of photos and short video clips with different angles and different focal lengths and you can pick whichever you like. This is a real time saver when you want to catch a moment, but you're not sure on what the best option is. Instead of taking multiple photos and videos, the phone will do it all for you in under 10 seconds and you can pick and share and even have multiple options for different social media channels. Nice, right? As for the 108 megapixel sensor and its resolution, we did find some interesting examples on the S20 Ultra, for example photo of the beach with plenty of people taken from about 100 meters away. It's amazing what you can see when you crop the photo, there's so many details and you can even make out the newspaper headlines that someone is reading. And that's the normal camera, not telephoto, which on S20 and S20 Plus allows for super resolution zoom up to 30 times and 100 times on S20 Ultra. We did test that as well, but with a, such a high zoom, even though the phone was on a stand, every step on laminate flooring would cause a shake, so it was hard to get a proper impression. We're looking forward to getting the phones for an in-depth testing in real-world situations. Selfie aficionados might be surprised to find that this year there's no dual selfie camera on any of the S20 phones. S20 and 20 Plus come with a 10 megapixel front camera, while the Ultra model has 40 megapixels. All models front camera's aperture is f2.2. We already mentioned the look of a main camera model when we talked about the design. Oddly enough, they all look different and the bigger model on S20 Ultra looks nicer than on other two models. Maybe some of you will have a different opinion, so please share your thoughts in the comments. To sum it all up, S20 Ultra offers some expected advantages over the other two models and is certainly the most desirable if the price is no object. If you are intent of spending a lot of money on a flagship phone, it makes sense to spend a little more to get the best one, so we expect the Ultra model to be the most popular of the bunch. All the S20 models support 5G on a chipset level, but it's quite possible that Samsung might choose to offer non-5G enabled S20s on some markets at a lower price. Speaking of price, we're already used to flagship phone prices going up with each generation. Someone's gotta pay for all the innovation, right? I mean, sure, there's no more 4 or 6 gigabytes, but 12 or 16. There are reasons why the prices are going up, but I don't have to justify the price, manufacturers do, and the consumers are the ones that have the final say in whether some device is uh, too expensive or not. We didn't get the official prices for these models from Samsung, but some rumored figures are 899 euros for 4G S20 and 999 euros for a 5G one. S20 plus 5G could be 1099 euros and S20 Ultra could start at 1349 euros for a 128 gigabit model and go up to 1549 euros for a 512 gigabit one. Overall, we are very impressed with what S20 series is bringing to the market. Well, maybe a little less impressed with the design, but that one is a personal preference. Compared to the same time last year and S10 series, we do think S20 leaves a better impression. Brutal hardware, seemingly incredibly capable cameras and the best screen so far with 120Hz refresh rate. Stay tuned for a detailed review of these phones in which we will find out how these phones perform in some real use scenarios. In the meantime, let us know how you like the S20 series in the comments below. We hope you liked this video, if you did, please support us by subscribing to our channel and also visit our channel for more interesting tech reviews. My name is Ivan and I'll see you next time.